Good afternoon and welcome. Thank you for joining me here this lunch hour on the ninth floor of the King County Courthouse. This is what has become an annual event uh, for our office and it's the annual State of the Office speech and I'm so thrilled to be here and to look out at these bright shining faces that make up the King County Prosecuting Attorney's Office. One of the things that we've done recently to try to capture who we are and what we're about is to create a little video. We call it the values video. And if you've seen the new Star Wars movie, it's, it's a lot like that. We're trying to do some of the same things with a much, much smaller budget. Uh, but what we did is we brought together some of the leaders of the office, some of the people who really make this place run, and they were asked by a filmmaker this question. It's an important question. How do you define justice? Let's take a look. Our mission statement is pretty simple. Our mission is to do justice. To me, ultimately, justice is, is achieved when a person who has done something to harm the community has been held accountable. But justice can also be trying to look behind the conduct and see, you know, why did this defendant do this? Are they mentally ill? Are they addicted to drugs? And so if we can both, you know, try to reduce the harm to the community, but also try to restore whatever deficits were in the life of the defendant so that he or she doesn't do it again, then that to me would be justice. Justice in the family support world, that means serving children, serving families, treating people fairly um, as we find them. And, you know, I think our office does a really good job with that. You know, there are a lot of things that happen um, when you have 13,000 employees working for King County um, where we did somebody wrong and we really hurt somebody. And it's our responsibility to figure out what is the right way to address that wrong. And because the mission of our office is to do justice, we approach it from the standpoint of what is the just result here? Um, and it feels good to be able to approach a case in that way. And I think in an office where we have tremendous discretion, uh, where the truth is we're making determinations about who should be charged with a crime or what crime they should be charged with or how to resolve a case. I mean, those are enormous decisions that impact people's lives really profoundly. Thank you for the new lifestyle, and most of all, thank you for doing your job. And that's something that you wrote to the person that resident. When I look at some of the great changes over the years, in the last 30 years in our office, I, I, I look at how we handle drugs. Starting in 1994, when we, when we came up with the drug court, that taught us, it taught people like me, that drug treatment works and that drug treatment deserves a place in the menu of acceptable outcomes, of desirable outcomes in the criminal justice system. For the last four years, um, our office has been involved in a program called LEAD, which stands for Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion. We are diverting people out of our system with the promise of immediate uh, access to treatment and care. The officers who are arresting an individual for drug delivery or possession can look at somebody's criminal history and look what they know about that person and decide, you know what, rather than booking this person and sending them to jail and sending them potentially to prison and through prosecution in the ordinary course, I'm going to divert this case and take them to the lead case manager who will offer them services. Let's engage people into a treatment program, let's hold them accountable, um, let's believe that we can do that and sort of really bring about something more than a conviction. You know, we can't solve every problem, you know, with a courtroom in a jail cell, as Dan likes to say, and uh, I think the 180 program is a perfect example of that. So the 180 program is something we've done now for four years. We've had nearly 2,000 youth go through this. So we could have charged and put them in a courtroom. Instead, this program will, if you're arrested this month, you'll be invited to a program next month uh, where you'll be introduced to a whole bunch of caring people in the community. If there's anyone that's coming into our office, I almost think it should be a required experience that someone attend the 180 workshop because it, it puts a face on the people that we represent. It puts a face on the people that we bring into the criminal justice system. And we want you to make a turnaround and we think it's a much better outcome for minor crimes than to put them just into the court system. We have a lot of very talented people who work in our office, lawyers and staff, very experienced people. Um, so there are a lot of resources to rely on to talk about the complex issues that are facing our community. Um, and when you, when you approach an issue like that um, from, you know, lots of, from different people with lots of experience, 
um, looking at the issue, you get you get the value of that experience and those perspectives. So you come up with um, with good answers. You come up with potentially new ways of approaching things. Um, and that's a pretty powerful thing, and I think that's a, a unique thing about our office. The key to being engaged is to be challenged. In the civil division, if you're in the litigation section, you get you've got you know 15 or 20 cases the first day you walk in the door. So there's lots of challenge. Learn how to do particular uh, types of crimes, and at the same time, not spend too long in any given field that we become bored or jaded or ineffective. The thing we have to make sure we do is to support people and to make sure that they have the tools that they need to be successful. I really feel like the supporting my prosecutor and making sure that they are ready to present their case properly is really very, very important. <laughs> Our office is always looking to refine what they're doing and how they're approaching different crimes or how they're approaching different social problems that end up in the criminal justice system, uh, and I appreciate that. You know, all of society's most complicated problems come to our doorstep. And yes, we'll file cases, we'll send people to prison who deserve to be sent to prison, but not every complicated issue can be resolved in a courtroom or in a jail cell. Sometimes they can be resolved better partnering with the community. And that's, I think, a new definition for the role of the prosecutor that we're trying to lead. In the end, we're trying to accomplish the goals of accountability, and that's what every prosecutor will say they do. We hold people accountable. But we also want to reduce the harm that is going to be done in the future by that person to the community. And sometimes that's done by helping that person with their own personal issues, whether it's a drug addiction or a mental illness. Uh, and, and if we can achieve an outcome that does all of those things, then clearly we've done justice. So asking people, this is unscripted, we asked everybody separately, what do you mean by justice? How do you define justice? And what I liked about that and, and about the hundreds of hours that were left on the cutting room floor is that there was a real, there was a, it was all in sync. People got it. People realized, and, and it's part of the love that they have for the job, is that they get to continue to define what we mean by justice every single day. So the state of the office, in one word, which is all you get when you do one of these, the state of the office, office is inspirational. You inspire me every day with your dedication, your determination, the hard work, the commitment to justice. And I also want to let you know that you inspire other people as well. That around the nation, people are looking at the King County Prosecuting Attorney's Office as a beacon of hope, as a place to look at to emulate what is good and right about the criminal justice system. And I'm so proud to be part of this movement with you. You know, there's never been a time of greater scrutiny or criticism of the criminal justice system than right now. And I think we have to decide, and I think we've already decided, that you can either be in there defending the status quo or you can be an agent of reform. And I think prosecutors have to be agents of reform. Prosecutors are natural leaders. But the thing about being a leader is you have to be a leader for your time. And I remember 25 years ago when I first got to work for Norm Mailing as his chief of staff, and Norm had decided for some reason that he wanted to run for attorney general. And he had a consultant who told him, this is how you win a campaign. You've got to be tough on crime. And I remember the, standing out there outside the Monroe Reformatory, and Norm was doing a take after take for his TV ad, which basically had this tagline, we're going to give criminals the same break they give us. No break at all. It was catchy, you only get a few seconds. Uh, but back then, in the early 90s, criminal justice reform was that. Let's get tougher. It's not tough enough. We have to make longer sentences. We have to make sure that, that we're so tough on crime that criminals will never want to be criminals. We have to make sure prison is so awful that they'll never want to go back. And that was the prevailing political moment. But this is 2016. And I think the mission right now what we need to do as leaders in the criminal justice system is to recognize that we need to build bonds of trust with the community. That we need to ask the community what was just asked of the people on this video, which is, how do you define justice? What does it mean to you? 
We cannot do justice to a community. You can only do justice with a community. You have to call it community justice because without the community, there can be no justice. And all you have to do is look around parts of America now that are on fire, parts where there's, those bonds have been broken. There's no more trust between the criminal justice system and the community. And we need to know that we have the opportunity here in this county to do something special. Part of how I come up with this conclusion that you are inspirational to the rest of the country is because I've been involved with National District Attorneys Association for a couple of years. I serve on the board now of the Association of Prosecuting Attorneys. In fact, we hosted 25 DAs from the largest counties here this summer. And so they got to see up close and personal what's happening here. And there may be a few of those offices that do one or two interesting things, but I can tell you there's no office that's doing all of the things that we are. And that's why I got invited to go have dinner with John Legend. <laughs> I'm sorry I couldn't take you with me, but I, in a sense I did take you with me. And when I forwarded that email from, from Mr. Legend's people to my wife and said, what do you think? She said two things. First of all, she said, can I come? I said, I said sorry, no. And then she said, well, if you don't go, you're never going to get invited again. So we cashed in some frequent flyer miles and I found myself at a private uh, supper club in the Soho area of Manhattan and uh, there were six DAs there, a couple federal prosecutors, a couple law professors and uh, in walked John Legend, a guy who I've really admired for his music all this time and it's true, he, as soon as he walked in he was the coolest guy in the room. I was number two all of a sudden, it just happened like that, <laughs> not used to that but um, but what I really admire about, about the night um, was after the celebrity dust kind of wears off was that we had a great conversation over dinner like you would with friends and we talked about what are the things that are going to have to happen if this era, which sociologists will always call the era of mass incarceration, when that's over, what's next? And what are the 50 things that we have to do to stop building and filling prisons? And so we talked about the full range. We have to graduate more students from high school because we know if you drop out of high school, you're five times more likely to go to prison during your lifetime. And that also implicates school disciplinary policies. We can't just kick kids out because they're irritating. We know what it's like to be irritating kids. We were irritating kids. But people didn't give up on us, and I think we give up on our kids too, too easily. Uh, we talked about things like, like um, mental health treatment and drug treatment on demand, not waiting to be arrested. We talked about the things that should happen in prison when you get sent to prison, rather than just being warehoused. What are the things that can, should be done to make you prepared for the day when you get out? We talked about reentry and collateral consequences. We talked about all of those things. And John Legend had, was taking notes. He had done his homework. They were making a movie. They're, it's a documentary that uh, he hopes to have at some film festivals. Uh, he's been into prisons and jails, and somebody had the bright idea that said, maybe you should talk to prosecutors, because maybe they have some, something to add. And then at 8.30, he looked at his watch and said, well, the second half of the football game is about to start. It's been a great night. Good night. And uh, he's a big Seahawks fan. His wife is from Snohomish, and so he had to go back. The Seahawks were on Monday Night Football, so he had to go back and watch the second half of the game, which I didn't mind at the time. And I also, you know, we, we had joked earlier about whether criminal justice reform was more important than pro football, and he made it clear that there was room in his life for both. <laughs> but you know, like we said on the, on the video, we do have all the complicated issues of the world coming to our doorstep to try to be fixed by what our limited uh, tricks are. And as I look around you know, this office and I look at the things that we're doing, I see a common thread. That we're, it's a common thread of support for people who are vulnerable, treatment for people who are sick, and attention to the root causes of violence. But all of the things that we're able to do to be innovative and to be inspirational in this office start with the fundamental excellence of our practice. And in the criminal division, the core function is holding people accountable. It is uh, keeping constitutional promises and convicting people constitutionally. It is dealing with some of the most difficult subject matter that, you, that anyone will ever have to deal with. And I know that when you see violence, when you see abuse, when you, the things that you have to see working in the criminal division of this office are things that you wish you'd never seen or things that you can never unsee. I know that takes a toll and I admire you for doing it and for diving into it day after day after day. 
But I also know that our excellence is, is carries forward everything else we want to do. And we have the best trial lawyers in the state in the King County Prosecutor's Office, and I will put us up against anybody. We have excellent support staff, we have excellent attorneys, and we have a high degree of integrity. There's nothing more that you could want. And in fact, if we just wanted to stop right there, we would have an excellent office. But it's the fundamental excellence of our core function that allows us to do more and to realize that we can be leaders in this time when we need to build trust with the community. We need the community's help to define what justice is. And I know that each of you contributes immensely to that as well. Every time you deal with a victim, a witness, a juror, a judge, even a defense attorney, you're representing the kind of ethic that we're talking about here in, in this video. Each of you is an ambassador uh, to improve our relationship with the people that we serve. There are so many things going on in the office that if I talked about all of them, we'd have to buy lunch and we can't do that. So I'm going to keep it to a, a couple of things that I want to focus on. And the, the first is the LEAD program, and you saw Mary Barbosa talk about it. And, you know, we got invited back to the White House in July, and it was a two-day conference focused only on King County's LEAD program. We had 25 different jurisdictions from around the country, 200 people in the executive office building, which is next door to the White House. Mary, typically, though she's done all the work, had a trial, so she couldn't go. But Natalie, Walton Anderson, I don't know if Natalie's here. She and I had this high net. High net. We had a great ex experience just being able to, to be there at the White House, but realizing that the, the president of the United States, when he heard about the LEAD program, told his staff, we need to bring the, the power of, of to, the power to convene, that is the president's, and convene this national group to look and see, what are they doing? What are they doing in King County, Washington? Well, it turns out, we've been doing this now for four years, it turns out that if you try to help people who are homeless and addicted and mentally ill, that you can have a better outcome than if you just try to arrest them. It's, it's amazing how that turned out, but the, the University of Washington has done a study and it showed that the people who got into the LEAD program were up to 58% less likely to be rearrested than the people who didn't get it. 58%. We would have been happy with like 10, 20%. And the people that, we've, that are in the LEAD program, I mean, we've, we've cherry-picked, if that's the right use of that term, the hardest cases. And I think most of the people in the LEAD program could not make it in drug court because they don't know how to show up at a certain place at a certain time. They need so much case management. They need, they're homeless, they need a place to live, they're severely addicted, they have all sorts of unresolved trauma from being out on the streets for decades and decades. So the LEAD program is part of a continuum that I see as, as, as a new approach, as a wiser approach to drug addiction. I'm a huge drug court fan, I was part of the creation of drug court 20 years ago and it, has, it is doing tremendous work as is mental health court and veterans court. All the therapeutic courts are great. But not everybody can succeed in all of them. And so I think that that continuum includes the LEAD program. Yesterday we had a, a group of people from uh, Salem and Portland and Los Angeles coming up to see what is it that they're doing in King County and, and how can we replicate it where we live. So it's putting us on the map. It's an inspirational program around the country. I also want to mention just that we also mentioned in the, in the video the 180 program. The 180 program is a classic example of restorative justice. We're using our power of, of the law to bring these kids back into the community and said, say to this, this group, this wonderful group of people in the community, here are our kids. They're our kids. We're all raising them together. Now, let's, first of all, the community does things that, that the prosecutor can't do. The first thing they, that they say to these kids is, we love you. I could try to say that, but it just wouldn't really come off like it does when, when the community says, we love you, we care about you, we believe in you, and then they take off from there. So I, I, the rule isn't, as Jimmy Hung announced, that you're required to go to the 180 program. But if you want to, we'd love to have you come and see Lisa Mannion about that. We'd love to have you come see it. There's one uh, this Saturday at noon at the Seattle University School of Law, which is another awesome thing that Dean, Dean Clark gave us forever and for free, Seattle University Law School, to run the 180 program. But the success of that has led to other things. So starting this month, and thanks to Stephanie Trollin and Jimmy, I don't know if Jimmy's here or not. Is he working? Someone's got to stay back and work. Uh, and Emily Peterson and other people up at Juvenile, we have begun the FERS program. And it's got to be called FERS because it's at Alder and Spruce. It's a tree thing. But FERS stands for Family Intervention Restorative Services. 
and what it is is it's, it's a way to help families who are having uh, problems with their out of control kids. You know, domestic violence at juvenile court doesn't mean intimate partner in dating violence. Most of it is parent-child or child against sibling. And for forever, we have had this program called Step Up. It's a great mediation program, and it helps parents and kids figure out how to live together because they're always going to be parents and kids. But we have offered it only upon conviction. And a lot of parents don't want to go down that road. They don't want to drive their kid to court to testify against their kids so they can get a conviction so that then they can get help. They wanted help when they called 911. And so what FERS does is that within 24 hours of the arrest, it's a mandatory arrest, right, so they're going to get booked, right away we have now additional specialized juvenile probation counselors and, and we've doubled the size of Step Up. We're offering that youth and their parent immediate help. And if they agree to go into the Step Up program, then we agree not to file that case. It's a pre-filing pre diversion uh, program. And so far we've got maybe, what, half a dozen, 10 kids in it or so. But up to 300 kids a year will be, will be uh, offered this alternative. And we're helping families in a time when they need help. So FERS is a revolutionary. There's one other county in the country that we know of, because we stole it from them, uh, that's doing it. Ours is going to be better, but it's, it's, it's part of it's part of the continuum of things that we can do to help and to work with the community, and to give the community what they want. They want help when their kids are violent. Speaking of violence, uh, we continue to do amazing things in the domestic violence unit. And led by David Martin and his team of other experts, uh, the, the big project on the table right now is to perfect the implementation of the firearm surrender statute that was passed by the legislature a year or so ago. We know that in, in homes where domestic violence is a chronic problem, that women are five times more likely to be murdered when there are guns in that home. And so the single most important thing we can do to, to save lives in King County is to get those guns out of that house during that emotional time, that roller coaster of domestic violence. Uh, the legislature gave us the structure. We have the tools. We just need to bring everybody together. And David Martin is leading. Uh, this path of protocol that will get the courts and the police agencies and the prosecutors and everybody on, on, online so that we can make firearms surrender a routine thing because it just makes so much sense. We've also done some uh, interesting th new things in conviction review. You know, the, sometimes when things go wrong in the criminal justice system and people start to question whether someone's been wrongfully convicted, apparently there's some TV show out about that now. I haven't had time to watch it. but. Uh, you know, we have to have a place to, to, to put those uh, cases for review. So Ann Summers, in addition to her many other uh, tasks, has agreed to be our conviction review unit uh, and look at uh, cases when there's an issue that's raised. Uh, and she's also looking at the ISRB cases, the Indeterminate Sentencing Review Board, uh, cases where they're going back and resentencing people who were sentenced as juveniles for really horrific, violent crimes, and Ann has been doing that too. So that's a new practice, but a very important practice. Another practice that we've really taken to new, to new heights um, is our clemency practice. And we're the only county in the state that has an active clemency practice. Carla Lee is leading that uh, in the front office. And we first started by looking at all the three strikes cases that went through the office 20 years ago. You know, I have to say I was never a huge three strikes fan because I remember when your third, second degree robbery got you a standard range of 15 to 20 months. And after three strikes in 1994, it became forever. And I always thought there was got to be a sweet spot between 15 months and forever. So we're trying to find that. And through the clemency process, and often we are at reaching out to attorneys to, to represent people that we think are good candidates. Uh, but we have um, been able to support uh, 17 different cases where the, the governors, Gre Gregoire and then Governor Inslee, have uh, granted clemency. And they've only done it because the King County prosecutor is saying this is the right thing to do. Uh, and it's, I think it's part of bringing balance. It's part of, you know, of, of recognizing that the community, many people in the community saw the three strikes law as just a way to lock up more people and for crimes that didn't deserve it. So we want to be open to that. We want to, and I don't know if the legislature is ever going to change the three strikes law, but we can change our practice, which we have, and we can go back and look at old cases because I think that is our responsibility. I mean, we look at cold cases that haven't been solved, but we should also look at any case that's gone through this office and continue to ask, does this sentence make sense? I'm so proud of the work that uh, we've been doing, and he's He's so humble, he's about to leave the room. But Val Ritchie, standing in the back there, has 
completely changed our approach to commercial sexual exploitation. And uh, if you noticed it all in the Seattle Times editorial page today, they came out in praise of the work that Val has been doing with other partners in the community, the Organization for Prostitution Survivors, the police agencies. We've really changed the way that we look at this crime. And the women who are being exploited and prostituted, we, never, we have no interest in prosecuting them. We want to help them because most of them are there against their will. And we know that the harm of prostitution is driven entirely by the buyers. And so what we've been focusing on is, is a program that Val calls Buyer Beware. We're putting that news out to the buyers that this is no longer okay and that what you're doing causes tremendous harm and that they need to be held accountable. That's putting us on the map. There are very few cities uh, in America that have changed the way that they've looked, they're looking at this very complicated case. But we're not done. Oh my gosh, we're not done. In 2016, we're going to really launch into something that I call data-driven prosecution. Uh, we had the chance to, um, I'm all about stealing, borrowing, whatever you want to say, good ideas from other people. And so we sent Jeff Baird, Aaron Ehlert, and Amy Montgomery back to the Manhattan DA's office to see what they're doing. Because the Manhattan story is amazing. There's a place where just a few years ago, they had about 500 murders a year in New York City. Last year, they had 36. So they've used what the police commissioner calls the peace dividend and, and to take uh, the prosecutors off the front lines of homicide trials. And their most experienced prosecutors are now in something called the Crime Strategies Unit. And they're looking at how to identify the most violent people in Manhattan and to follow them and to know where they are and to treat every case as if that, that they're involved in as if it's an opportunity to buy some more peace for the community. So the data-driven pro data prosecution, it's something we've been doing in the car theft initiative and in RBI for a long time, because we you know, we know if you can identify the most prolific offenders, you can have a real impact on community safety. But we're taking it to a new level with new partners, with community partners and police partners in 2016. There's so much going on, and the, and, and the change and the, and the social sciences and the criticisms and the issues are, are so vast uh, and, and swirling right now that I thought, you know, I could really use some help. And so we're establishing a criminal justice reform policy committee, and it's going to be chaired by uh, Ann Summers because of her work with training, Rich Anderson because of, he has a foot in each of the law schools in our, in our town and knows what they're saying about us. Uh, and also Stephen Thomas, because it, this idea came out of a conversation that he and I had uh, some months ago, that we could really use a place for people who want to be involved in policy discussions to meet, to decide. This group has total autonomy. I'm not telling them what books to read or what st things to study, but I want them to get a hold on the latest criminal justice policy issues that are out there. And if it is something that informs our practice, then we should take a look at it. If they identify better practices or good ideas, then we should take a look at it. But we need a think tank. And so soon you will get an application uh, form and an email. And if you're interested in being part of the Criminal Justice Reform Policy Committee, you can apply. We'll select. We can't have everybody be on the committee, but we'll, the chairs will figure out how to fill the room with, with a good representation of staff and attorneys from all four corners of the office. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to their work uh, because we, we need to be on the cutting edge of, of the things that are being done out there, the things that are being said out there, the criticisms. We need to, to look at those and say, is that fair criticism and it does it affect our practice? When I look at family support, uh, there's, there's so, so much going on out there. And, and the, the one program that I always like to, to brag about a little bit, because nobody else does this, is the Navigator program. And when a, when a person gets out, particularly when someone is trying to make that transition from prison back to the community, you know, our old practice and a practice in many places is to give them a bill for 50 or $100,000 in back due child support. Well, what that does is it drives them underground. It drives them away from their family. It means that it takes away all the incentive to get a job. The Navigator program does quite the opposite. It recognizes that successful reentry from prison depends on family ties and depends on education and employment. And so the program, working with South Seattle Community College and lots of other community partners, is look, is look, looks for a way to make a deal where the obligation is acknowledged, but, but we also are trying to help that person get to a point in their life where they can really pay child support and really continue to be involved in their child's life. So the Navigator program has put our family support uh, unit on the map as well. 
In the civil division, so much going on there, but just a couple things I wanted to mention. Right now, they're uh, locked in some, some serious negotiations. John Gerberding is part of that to make sure that the county-owned Harborview Hospital, just up the hill, continues to have a working relationship with UW Medicine. Super important things we take for granted, but these are contracts and they have to be re renegotiated and they have, to be, uh, they have to be delicately handled, so all of the diplomatic skills that John brings to the table are just gonna make that happen. You also need to know if you're not in the civil division, if you remember that, remember Promise? Anybody remember Promise? And then we had to go to PBK and there was a lot of pain. Well, they, they feel your pain now because in the, the civil division now is going to a new program called Legal Files. And it's going to be awesome when it is awesome, but you know, there's also some pain <laughs> uh, getting there. So uh, just, just know if, if, they're, if you see them and they have a, that look on their face, that's why. But it's going to increase their capacity to do all sorts of more complicated litigation and to modernize their practice. We're also in the civil division, the home of the best trial lawyers in the state. They continue to win big cases, uh, defending the county fisc against spurious claims against our buses. Our buses are fine, they're safe. I, I wouldn't stand right on the corner, I'd step back just a little bit. Um, our roads are perfectly safe and well designed. Uh, they continue to win employment lawsuits and, and uh, recently won in the, in the Ninth Circuit uh, court to defend the county's transit advertising policy, which is a really hot button issue if you've you followed that around the country. What kind of advertising do you have to accept on your bus as a public forum? So doing tremendous work there. And the other thing I wanted to mention, the civil division, is something they call the community justice project, and it's completely in line with everything we're talking about. There are two areas where we are specifically the municipal authority in an urban area. One is White Center and one is Skyway. And in those areas, they've been particularly hard hit by abandoned homes, bank forfeitures, abandoned homes that then get broken into and become the center of, of crime and disruption in the community. Well, the Community Justice Project, Darren Carnell, Christy Craig, Michael Hepburn, Carla Lee gets to go along and have some fun too, and, and, and Kevin Wright's part of that. There, it's, it's all about using the code enforcement laws to, to button up those nuisances in the community and, and to make sure that if there are homes that are being abandoned that we can contact the owner and flip them and get them back on the market and get them fixed up in the homes of, of a good homeowner that adds to the community doesn't subtract to the community. This is the same group that's also gone after the unlicensed marijuana retailers which tended to proliferate in areas of concentrated poverty because because they thought they'd be left alone but it added to all the misery there too. So we had identified about 15 unlicensed marijuana sellers in Skyway and White Center, and thanks to the Community Justice Project, they're all shut down today. There's a couple other things I want to mention that I'm pursuing. You know, I've, we've all seen the, the national discussion about the death penalty, and it continues to grow, and, and, and news today about you know, the execution last night, and, and Supreme Court continues to issue opinions about the death penalty, and, there was, this is the time uh, in the state where there are no pending death penalty trials. So I convened the other elected prosecutors in WAPA as their president, and we had a robust discussion about it from a firsthand knowledge of, of prosecutors. What, what do we think about this? Do we need this in our state? And we concluded, and, and I think like any other group of 39 people, you have people who are supporters, you have people who are opponents, people who in the middle have misgivings, but we concluded that as a prosecutors what we really want to know is, is this what our communities want? Because the death penalty in Washington came about as a part, as a uh, vote of the people initiative in 1975. So 40 years ago the people voted and now that we've had this 40 year experience, we've had two contested executions in 40 years, is this something that continues to be important to the people? And so we come out on record as asking for a referendum from the legislature. We'll see if we get there, but we're part of that ongoing discussion right now about this very important uh, criminal justice reform issue. I've also always thought it was weird and strange and totally misleading that the only partisan office in King County government is the prosecuting attorney. The council, the executive, they're nonpartisans. Uh, even though they caucus and stuff, uh, the you know the sheriff, the elections director, assessor, all nonpartisan. It's because the, the office of prosecuting attorney was created by state statute in RCW Title 36, and so I always thought we'd had to go back to the legislature and change the state law. And the legislature is newsflash is a partisan place, and they didn't want to do that. But last 
fall, the Attorney General issued a, a formal official opinion that said in charter counties, the charter could be amended by a vote to create a nonpartisan office of the prosecuting attorney. And I strongly believe that politics has no place in this office. If you had the chance to read Chris Bailey's book or see him when he talked, he talked about that time when Chuck Carroll was the prosecutor here from 1948 to 1970. And while being the prosecutor, he was also the head of the county Republican Party. So to get hired here, you had to have some connection. Some precinct committee officer had to offer your name up. And then the first question in the, in the interview is, what are you going to do to help the reelection campaign of the prosecutor? Now, those of you who've been hired since then might notice none of those things are true here. <laughs> thanks to Chris, thanks to Norm, you know, we, we, we realized that, that, that politics in the office was a, uh, really a destructive force and all of the scandal that ultimately led to the downfall of, of the Chuck Carroll administration, um, I think you can tie to that. But this is our chance to put on the ballot before the people of King County that question and ask the community to find justice, to find the prosecuting attorney. And I think uh, I will certainly be advocating that they vote to make this a nonpartisan office. A couple other fun things. I hope you're following us on Facebook. You know, when you're on Facebook, you have this desire to be liked. So please like us on Facebook. And, and the reason that I wanted to go to Facebook is, again, it's a way to tell our story to the community. It's very hard through the, the, the mainstream media has shrunk. They don't have the, the attention span or the bandwidth. But we do have so many great stories. We have thousands of great stories that are happening in this office. And so if you look at our Facebook page, you'll notice that we tend to try to profile the people who work here and the kind of work that they do. And I'm very proud of all of you, and I want to tell all your stories. So it, do, if you're not on it, if you haven't checked us out, check us out. If you have ideas for Facebook, please share them with us. Uh, if you want to profile one of your friends, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll do that. But they have to consent. We won't do it one of those sneaky profiles. But Facebook is awesome, and it's a way for us to communicate who we are to our community. And in, the, in furtherance of that, starting this fall, I'm going to host a one-hour radio show on a brand new radio station in town, KVRU 105.7, Rainier Valley Radio for the Valley and Beyond. It's pretty good, huh? So uh, my producer, Michael Hepburn, is back there somewhere because he knows how to twist. Hi, Michael. He knows how to twist all the knobs, but he and I are going to do this weekly show. It's going to be a call-in show. We're going to talk about issues. We're going to have the community call us up and talk to us. Brand new station. It'll, it'll have a reach of about 500,000 people from Kent to across the lake, and we'll see. You know, we're going to play a little jazz, too, keep things interesting. But they've given me an hour and said, do whatever you want to do with it. And to me, it's consistent with continuing to want to communicate about justice to our community. You know, I got invited to go back to um, Brooklyn last fall on a, on a summit that they called the Wrongful Conviction Summit. Because if you followed the news at all, the Brooklyn DA, Ken Thompson, replaced a guy who had been there for 25 years. And once they started unpacking some of these convictions, they realized they had a real thread of, uh, of Brady violations. They had a lot of coerced confessions. They had a lot of people they thought really were innocent who were serving time in, in prison for murder. So. D.A. Thompson put this thing together, and, and I he invited me to come be part of it. And the, one of the themes that people kept saying was, you know, well, we're not perfect because we have all these human beings. Human beings are involved because the criminal justice system is a machine whose moving parts are made up by fallible human beings. And it's true, and I think it's remarkable that we're as accurate as we are with all these human beings. But I also thought, as I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, you know, the, the fact that humans are in charge of the criminal justice system should be seen as a strength, not a weakness. When I look around this room and I see the people here and, and the, the experience and the dedication, the judgment, the integrity, the compassion that is, is the people in the King County Prosecuting Attorney's Office, I think I'm so glad that we're not run by some computer because they wouldn't have any of those things. And so I urge us all to connect with our humanness as we consider how to define justice. You know, the best reforms that we can think of are things that we're, we're going to come from the fact that we desperately want to improve our community. And I think everything's on the table going forward as agents of change. I mean, defending the status quo is fine if it's defensible. Instead, prosecutors are really good at defending the status quo, but I think we also have to think creatively about the things that we do. We shouldn't be afraid to admit when we've made mistakes. I think the people don't expect us to be perfect, but they expect us to admit when we've made mistakes and to try to do things to, to change it. And the people don't expect us to have an answer for 
everything, but they expect us to at least ask the right questions and to evaluate our outcomes. I think when we're looking at past practices, and I mentioned this on maybe too many times on the video, but I, I look at how we've dealt with drugs and how in the time, and, and I didn't know anybody who called it the war on drugs, but you know what I mean when I say the war on drugs. There was a time in the state that 26 percent, more than one in four inmates in the state prison was there for a drug offense. Today that's down to 7 percent. And as that, it's done, that's dropped to 7 percent largely because of the things that we're doing here. And I think America is ready for this conversation, a new approach to drugs. I mean, even in the presidential campaign, which is hardly the paradigm of enlightenment of the nation, candidates are saying, yeah, we get it. We get it now. Drug addiction is a bad thing because it's gone from the inner city. It's gone from communities of color. Now it's gone to middle America. And heroin addicts are dying at record rates. I think to take that approach and say, yes, we think treatment is important, it does require us to look back and say that maybe we've made mistakes in the past. There was a PBS Frontline show that is going to air, I think, next month or the month after. It's a retrospective on the war on drugs. And they had been to Seattle 20 years ago and covered our approach. And then they came back to Seattle because of LEAD, because of drug court, because of other things, and because we have a history, quite frankly, of unequal enforcement of our drug laws. And the interviewer asked me that question, well, now that the drugs affect white America, now treatment is what you want. And before, prison was the answer. And it's hard to deny that, that there, the racial impacts of the war on drugs. You can't deny it when it's, it's a statistic fact that almost 60% of defendants in state courts convicted of drugs during that 20-year period of time, 60% were African American. So it's hard to deny that. But it's also something that shouldn't keep us from looking at the new science of addiction, from looking at new approaches that we know work. Because like I say, drug court and lead other things have convinced crusty old drug warriors like myself that drug treatment is the desirable outcome for addicts in the system. So I said to the guy, and it'll end up on the cutting room floor, but it's a, it's a philosophy that I really believe in, that just because wisdom is slow to arrive doesn't mean you should ignore it when it does. And we're getting wiser about so many things. And, and the way that we deal with mental illness, the way we deal with drug addiction, our therapeutic courts are an example of that. All of the things that we've been talking about are an example of accepting new wisdom and understanding the power that we have to achieve better outcomes. You know, there are 3,000 counties in the United States. There's only one named after the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. We're lucky to live in that place. But it's not, he's not just a mascot. He's not just a husky or a seahawk or a cougar. He's the preeminent civil rights leader of our time. He is the figure that the world knows the United States by. as a guy who demanded rights, who, who fought for and died for change. I think it's an honor to be in the prosecuting attorney's office in the county named in, in his honor. And it, I think it also it compels us to do extraordinary things. It compels us to be inspirational. You know, Dr. King was an optimist. I like to think I'm an optimist, too, and I hope you are, too, because doing our work, if you're not an optimist, is very difficult. You have to believe that things are going to get better. And when his followers asked Dr. King, when are things going to get better? When are we going to be able to achieve this? He said... The moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends toward justice. See, he was trying to define justice, too, at that time. And it was clear he had many obstacles to justice. But being in the county named in honor of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King means that we've signed on to his dream as well. And so we can go forward compelled to do extraordinary things. Together, working with the community, we have the power to define justice. We have the power to define a system that reflects our best values and our aspirations for our kids. So as we leave this place, I want us to go forward together, being proud of being inspirational. You're inspirational to each other. You're inspirational to me. You're inspirational to the nation. You really are special, and we're doing something special here. 
So let's go forward with the community, be national leaders, and work toward excellence in the pursuit of justice, in the shared definition of justice. Let's invite the community to help us define that and go forward and build the best criminal justice system in America right here in the county named in honor of Dr. Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. Thank you.